morning. Can you all hear me okay? Good. Um, you know, before I dive in, I just wanted to take a moment and just, for one, thank you all. Uh, I became a Christian when I was 18 years old, and from that moment, I wanted to teach God's Word in somehow, some way. I never in a million years imagined I'd be up here, but in a large part of this is because of you all. So I want to just thank you for the blessing and the privilege it is to be able to just present God's word to you. Um, so before we dive in, let's pray. Uh, Father, your word, when it's used by your spirit in our lives, is powerful. It's life-changing. And so, Lord, we just ask that you be at work in each and every one of us this morning, that no matter where we're at, that you will meet us where we are and that you'll draw us closer to you. So we ask all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So about a month ago, I was watching the NFL draft. I know, very exciting stuff, right? Um, and it was interesting to see some of the reactions. Some of the guys, when they get drafted, they'd be jumping up and down. They'd, the poor reporter would just get crushed by these giant men who were just so happy that they had dreamed as big as they could dream, and that dream had come true. But then there was other guys, and they were excited. They still jumped up and down, but there was something different. Um, you could just see it in their eyes that while, yes, being drafted into the NFL was a childhood dream come true, they knew there was more work to do. They knew that something more, something greater, lay ahead for them. And what Paul here in Ephesians 1, 15 through 23 is saying, I think he's telling the Christians in Ephesus that what you've gone through, what you're experiencing is incredible. But it's just the tip of the iceberg. What you are experiencing in your relationship with God is amazing. But God has so much more of himself to reveal to you and to go through life with you. So what I hope that we get from this text, if you get anything, is that no matter who you are, no matter where you're at in your relationship with God, you can grow in your relationship with him. So we're going to be looking at Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. If you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's page 814 in that Bible. So Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, it reads, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So this is God's word for us this morning. Let's pray. Father, bless us this morning as we open up your word. If any of us here are at a place where we're questioning our faith, where we're struggling, or we're questioning who you are, may your spirit minister to us this morning. Help us to see who you are more clearly, and in doing so, enable us to trust our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the book of Ephesians, it's a letter of encouragement. It was written by the Apostle Paul while he was imprisoned in Rome. And this is written to the Christians in Ephesus. And most likely this letter was to be circulated to the Christians in the surrounding area. And I tell you what, these Christians, 
they needed encouragement. If Ephesus was this port city, this hub of the Roman Empire in Asia, and so there was just a myriad of cults, of different philosophies and different religions, and then as if that wasn't enough, the temple of Artemis was in Ephesus, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it's easy to see how the Ephesians could look around and just be discouraged, to feel like the whole world was against them. And while I'm not saying we're in a modern-day Ephesus, I know a lot of Christians, they look around at the world, and they're just discouraged. They feel like the whole world is against them. So as we dive in um, to this passage, let's all take to heart what Paul says here. And let's find encouragement that is only possible through growing in your relationship with God. Because I know it sounds cliche, but when that happens, it doesn't matter what's going on around you. When your relationship with God is growing, it doesn't even matter what's happening to you because you have the one who's greater than all those things. So look at verse 15 with me, and please, if you don't have a Bible open, open it up and turn there. So verse 15, Paul says, For this reason... Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. So whenever we see the words for this reason, that means whatever he's about to say is going to build off of what he just said. So before we go forward, I want to look back real quick. So in verse 3 through 14, Paul described the incredible work of God in a believer's life. He talked about the blessings, the forgiveness of sins, the redemption, the inheritance we have in Christ, how we are adopted into the family of God and that, when we are part, and that we are part of God's redemptive plans and purposes. And as if that wasn't enough, this work of God, something based not on anything good in me, not on anything I would do. This plan is grounded in his perfect will and his perfect character. And he also emphasized the fact that all of this, all of these incredible things we see about God, was part of his plan before the foundations of the earth. So think about it. Before the cosmos were created, God was at work. God was thinking of you. That is incredible. And then, so what Paul is saying in verse 15 when he says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, what he's saying is that everything he had just described all that amazing and wonderful work of God, Paul is saying, I see that in you. I see that in your faith and in the love that you're showing. What Paul's saying is that the faith and love that you're living out, that's the result of the presence and work of a living God in your life. And Paul knows that even though they're experiencing life in a way they never had before, a freedom, a joy, that there's more. That there are even more riches to be received as one grows in their faith and develops a deeper personal relationship with God. That's why in the second part of verse 16, and then going on to the 17, he wrote, Remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul knows that this continued work of God, this deepening of our faith, happens as the Holy Spirit applies the knowledge of God to our lives. And so this actually leads us to the first point I want to draw out from the text, is that you'll grow in your relationship with God as you increase in your knowledge of God, and it's applied to you by the Holy Spirit. And this is important for us as believers, as followers of Christ, to understand them. Um, and it's why 17 is so important. Paul prays that they are given the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. So in most of your Bibles, you're going to notice that the letter S in the word spirit is capitalized. That's showing us that it's the Holy Spirit. It's the third person of the Trinity that's imparting this knowledge. And that this knowledge isn't, you know, facts about how the world works. But it's a knowledge of God himself. And so at this point, I want to acknowledge that Paul's not just saying, Eph Ephesians, I hope you'll learn a lot about God. Paul is talking about a life-transforming, a life-giving 
type of knowledge that he wants them to grow in. Um, I heard another pastor describe the difference between knowing about someone and knowing something this way. Um, so if you were all going to describe me to someone, you'd maybe give my height, say, oh yeah, that guy's trying to grow a beard, but I don't know. I mean, glasses, maybe to give my occupation, he works at First Baptist Church. And those are all true, right? I mean, you all know a lot about me. But what if you asked my daughters about me? They don't just know about me. They know me. So if you ask, I mean, think about it. If you asked Ava, who's my oldest, she's about eight. If you asked her about me, how weird would it be if she's like, oh yeah, uh, Levi William Boland? Yeah, he uh, went to Luther I Seminary. His hobby is reading. And he uh, works at First Baptist Church. How weird would that be if that's how she described me as her dad? There would be something fundamentally wrong with our relationship if that's how she knew me. But she doesn't. My daughter knows me. We have a personal relationship. She would say, that's my daddy. I love him. He loves me. We play together. We read together. He'll always be there for me. And that's the type of knowledge that Paul is getting at here. He doesn't want you to, he doesn't want us, he doesn't want the Ephesians to know just about God. He wants us to grow in a knowledge that cultivates a personal relationship with him. And that is something that can only happen if the Holy Spirit is at work in us. So don't get me wrong, knowledge is important. We have to study, we have to think, we have to learn. But if the Holy Spirit isn't at work, we're just learning facts about God and we'll never grow to know him. So later on, I know you're asking, that's a whole lot to say and not give me some application. We're going to talk about how you cultivate that later. But for now, I just want you to kind of have this question floating around in the back of your mind throughout the rest of the sermon. Do you know a lot of facts about God? Or do you know God as a loving Heavenly Father who is your Savior? Because the answer to that question makes all the difference. So as the Holy Spirit develops our knowledge and applies that knowledge to our lives, we result in the knowledge of God. And in verse 18, we see what that leads to. We see the results of that knowledge. So in verse 18, we see having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So this is our second point, that you'll grow in your relationship with God as you grow in your knowledge of God, because it will deepen your understanding of the hope that you have been called to. And this hope, this isn't like wishful thinking for the future. Like, I hope the Broncos have a better season than a 6-10 and 10 record last year. But the hope I have in Jesus Christ is something completely different. Um, this, is a, this hope I have in Jesus, it's a hope that we experience in the present. We live knowing that by trusting in Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension, that we're changed from death and our sins and separation from God to eternal life and reconciliation to him. In this hope, we have the current experience of justification and the ongoing work of sanctification. And I know some of you are like, those are some big words. Well, let me explain to say we're justified, it means that in God's eyes, we're righteous. We're right and good and pleasing to him. Now, don't miss that. In Christ, when God looks at you, he's pleased. It means that we're no longer under the condemnation for our sin and that we have a right standing before God. then to say that we're being sanctified. It means that while that sinful nature remains in us, we're no longer under its condemnation, we're no longer under its rule, and that God is at work in our lives, allowing us to put to death the remnants of that sinful nature and cultivate this new life we have in him. Um, sorry. Oh, okay, and I, I'm still in here because I didn't want to miss this. Um, you could think of sanctification as bringing your life 
into what you already are in your justification. And as if that wasn't enough, there's also a future aspect of the hope. In a sense that we can live knowing that one day all sin, all evil, all tragedy, it will be undone and it will be made right. And this includes us. We have the hope that when you place your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you have God's promise that one day that sinful nature that hounds us will be completely done away with. And now we'll be able to truly live as we are created to. So because of the hope we have been called to, we can look at the world and we can acknowledge like, yeah, the world's messed up. I mean, all you have to do is watch the news to know that things are not as it should be. But know what's even scarier? I mean, if I'm being honest, it's looking at my own heart. It's looking at my own sin. And I can face that and say, yes, that pride, that tendency to wander, that lack of faith, that desire to build a good life that looks good on the outside, but if I'm honest, is a monument to myself and not God, I can face that. Because while I'm facing the world and while I'm facing my own sin, I can also acknowledge that God has overcome all the sin, that God has redeemed us, that God is at work in us, and that one day, justice will reign and all things will be made right. So as you increase in your knowledge of God, you'll deepen your understanding of the hope you have, which will grow your relationship with him. Next, in verse 18, we see that Paul prays that the Ephesian church grows in the knowledge of the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And so this is our third point, that you'll grow in your relationship with God as you increase in your knowledge of God because it will deepen your understanding of the inheritance you are to him. Now, that one caught me off guard a little bit because when I think of like inheritance, I usually think of like what I get, what God gives me because I'm a Christian. But that's not what it says here. What we see here is that Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wants the Ephesians to see the value of the inheritance they are to God. So I looked around the Bible kind of for other examples because I thought that was just a weird kind of principle. And it's not common in the New Testament. But when you go to the Old Testament, all of a sudden you see this coming out more and more. <clears throat> and usually when you see this, when people being referred to God as God's inheritance, it's in terms of God delivering people who are separated from him and who are in some sort of bondage, delivering them from that and reconciling them to him for his glory. And so we see this in verses like Deuteronomy 4.20. It's not going to be up here, so if you're taking notes, just write it down. Deuteronomy 4.20, which says, But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance, as you are this day. So here Moses is reminding the Israelites what, of what God has done and that he had saved them for a purpose which was his glory. And Paul here in our text in Ephesians, he's now applying that concept not just to the nation of Israel, but he's applying it to the work of Christ in the lives of all who place their trust in him. So in a world that says everything's just an accident and that ultimately what you do is meaningless, God here says something completely contrary. Here we see that God says, you as an individual are valued and loved. And at the same time, he says, you are part of something far bigger and far greater than yourself. And so I was thinking about implications, and I actually, you know, God's gracious and gave me a real life one of them. When one of my girls starts asking, like, do I matter? when they start wondering if they have any value, I can point them to the fact that Jesus, that in Jesus they are God's inheritance. This means God loves them so much that he has a plan and purpose for their life and that he promises to see them through all of life to the end. And then I started thinking, um, 
you know, what else do I get from this? And it's kind of interesting that, you know, when someone's at the end of their life, wondering if their life mattered at all, wondering if it had any value, I can point them to Jesus. I can point them to Jesus and tell them that God loves them so much that he planned their salvation before the beginning of time. I could say that he has a plan and purpose for their life up until their last breath. And the cool thing is, is that it doesn't end there. It goes on even into eternity. I could tell them that in Christ, they are God's inheritance. That he won't lose them. That he will see them through to the end. How awesome is that? By seeing ourselves as God's inheritance, we see God in a completely different way and we learn to trust God on a whole new level. Then in verse 19 through 23, this was actually the reason I was so excited to preach on this passage. Um, You know, we see that as you grow in your knowledge of God, you'll become more and more aware of the power of God that is at work in your life. And so this is our fourth point, that you can grow in your relationship with God because as you increase in your knowledge of God, you'll deepen in your understanding of the power of God towards you. So here Paul gives an incredible description of this power. Starting in verse 19, Paul wrote, And what is the measurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness, or which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So I feel like I need to get something out here real quick. Um, Sarah, all the time, gives me a hard time about having run-on sentences in my writing. But clearly I'm just being biblical here because Paul does not like periods. I mean, this whole passage in the Greek is one run-on sentence, which is ridiculous. So anyways, I digress. But in verse 19, Paul says he wants them to know the power of God that is at work in them. And then in verses 20 through 23, he lays out this incredible description of that power. He's given the Ephesians insight into how awesome and great the power of God truly is. I mean, so many times we think that our personal sin, our circumstances, or something outside of us is so great that we question, like, can God really overcome this? I mean, if we're being honest, how many of us in here, and you don't have to raise hands, but I tell you, It's going to be more of us than not. How many of us have something in our life right now where we're just praying God breaks through? But we act and we feel and we talk so much, so many times, in a way that we don't know if he really is. And yes, intellectually we know God's greater, But, you know, when life gets hard, when things outside of your control start knocking you down, it's easy to lose faith. And so if you're there, if you don't, if you're questioning what's going to happen next, I just want to encourage you, uh, look at verse 19 and just allow that to uh, minister to your soul. So Paul describes this incredible power starting in the second half of verse 19. He wrote, According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. So Paul is saying that this power that is at work in you as a believer in Christ, the same power that's at work fulfilling God's will in this world is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and asserted him back where he came from at the Father's right hand. And so, look at these locator words, because they're really important in verse 20. Paul says Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. 
So when the, in Old Testament, when the high priest gave the offering for the sins of the nation, the high priest would then sit down, showing that atonement had been made. But what we see here is that in Jesus Christ, the perfect high priest, he's provided perfect and full atonement for all of those who place their faith in him. And then we also see here Jesus, he's placed at the right hand of the Father, which is a sign of ultimate authority and power. And then when Paul says, in the heavenly places, once again he's emphasizing that this authority, this lordship, it's not just over the earth, it's not just over one you know, if we come up with weird stuff, it's not just over like one dimension. This is over all of the cosmos, whether the physical realm or the spiritual realm. And then Paul says, when Paul says, all rule and authority and power and dominion, and sorry, this is in verse 21, and above every name that is named, Paul's saying here that Jesus has authority and lordship over every person and everything, whether spiritual or or physical. And keep in mind that power is only as good as the authority of the one who yields it. And when it comes to Jesus, he's unmatched in both categories. Then Paul writes, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So once again, Paul is just clarifying, in case we haven't gotten it by this point, that whether it's here on this earth right now or whether it's in the new heaven and new earth, Jesus rules and reigns. And remember that this is a letter of encouragement. So like the Ephesians, we can learn, right? And we see this awesome power. But when we look around us, we're like, well, what's going on? If God is so great, why do things sometimes look so horrible? And so I think Paul gives us a glimpse. So this isn't a full comprehensive view of the power of God at work, but a glimpse of where God is working in verses 22 through 23. So they read, And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I got to say, this is a weirdly worded passage. Like the Greek's very strange. And scholars debate over the exact meaning of it all. But what I believe we can take away from this is that if you've placed your, Jesus, your faith in Jesus, you're connected to the church by the power of God, which we just learned about. So you're connected to the church, which is composed of all believers throughout history, but you're also connected to the church that we make up here, that's gathering right now. So we could be encouraged by the fact that as we gather here on Sundays, as we worship God, as we pray, as we learn about his word, that we're transformed by the power of God. And that that same power that connects us together is at work through us collectively, which makes up the church to impact the world. So when we talk about missions overseas, that's the power of God working here as well as other places to send those missionaries to work in those lives of those missionaries. You all here at First Baptist Church of Golden are part of the redemptive work that those missionaries are carrying out overseas. That's where the power of God is at. And as all this happens, like not only do we benefit, not only do, do those outside the church benefit, but as this happens, we embody and reflect who Jesus is, which is the greatest service that we as a church could provide. And though we do it imperfectly, by the power of God that we just learned about, we reflect the power and the character of the one who is perfect and the only one who can truly fulfill and satisfy our greatest needs and desires. So just a side note, this is one reason why being part of a church is so important. Not because it's full of perfect people. All you have to do is talk to me to kind of burst your bubble there. Not because after Sundays you're going to leave just feeling warm and fuzzy and great and life's going to be awesome. 
but because as a Christian you are meant to worship in fellowship with other believers as part of a church. And when that occurs, you're connecting yourself to the power of God in a unique way that grows your faith, but it also makes you part of the mission of God. So when someone isn't part of the church, they're separating themselves in a way from that power, from that work of God in their lives, but they're also separating themselves from what God would do through them, whether it's just to minister to someone here who's sitting next to you, or whether it's to do something that's far further reaching across the world. Many times, you know, we want the result, but we skip the source, right? We want the experience. We want the relationship. We want to have the relationship of a good marriage. We don't want the work, though, and the time that it takes. And we got to be careful that we don't do that here. Um, CS, I believe it's C.S. Lewis who said, if you want happiness and you shoot for happiness, you're going to miss it every time. But if you shoot for God, you will get far more than you ever imagined. And you may just get happiness in the end as well. And I think that it's the same way here that if we want to grow in our relationship with God, we have to have the Holy Spirit applying the knowledge of God to our lives. And as that happens, You'll grow in your faith because it will deepen your hope. You'll see your value to God and you'll deepen your understanding of the power of God that's at work toward you. And the reality is, is that as you grow, your desire to know God will just grow more and more. This isn't something where you reach a certain point and you're done. As you grow in your faith and your knowledge of God, it will spur you forward. I mean, it's like the kindling that just leads to a greater fire that burns brighter and brighter and more intensely. And this growth, this relationship with God, continues all through our lives. And the cool thing is it actually continues even on into eternity. So I want to encourage you that no matter who you are, you and I will never exhaust the riches of who God is in his glory. So whether you feel you're far, too far from God, that you have sinned and messed up so bad, he would never want you, or whether you're someone who has walked faithfully with him for decades and has a thriving relationship with him, there's more of God for you. There's more freedom, there's more grace, there's more mercy, there's more love, there is more wonder and amazement of God for you. So before I get into the application, and I know this has been a pretty heavy sermon, it's a lot to take in. Um, I want to actually take a moment, and we're just going to pray silently, probably for about one to two minutes. And I'm going to say it's going to feel like an eternity, and it's going to feel awkward, but that's okay. Because so many times we rush through worship, we just want to learn more and move on. But we need to take a moment, stop, and just be silent before God. Um, and I want you, as you pray, I want you, if you're far from him, and even the concept of praying seems ludicrous, take that to him. If you know God, but you feel so far from him, or you feel like your faith has grown stale, take that to God. No matter who you are, in your relationship or where you are in your relationship with him take that to him and ask for the spirit to guide you to give you wisdom and revelation of himself and so after we've done with that I'll touch on a few application points and then we'll wrap things up so let's pray
Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. I showed a little grace and mercy as a minute and a half. But uh, so what do we do? How do we cultivate this type of life transforming, life giving knowledge? I think the first thing we do is we have to pray. Whether you're a non-believer just feeling things out or you're a veteran a veteran of the faith, like prayer is where we start. And for me, I like to use scripture to help guide my prayer. So as I was thinking through what would I pray to kind of begin this, um, Matthew 5 verse 3 came to mind. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs will be the kingdom of God. And in Matthew 5 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So with those in mind, as you pray, express your need for God. Express your sin, your need for forgiveness, and thank Jesus for the salvation we have in him. That's where we start if we're going to cultivate a life-transforming knowledge. Um, James 1.5, right? If you need wisdom, and I'm paraphrasing, all you need to do is ask. So as you pray, you can ask God for wisdom and ability to see him as he is in his workings in your life. When we pray, we could take our worst fears, our biggest insecurities, our most intense emotions, and we could bring it to God. That's where life-changing, life-transforming knowledge will be will start. Take those things to God, talk with him about it, process it with him, and hand it over to him. Because no matter who you are, no matter where you're at in your faith, no matter what you've gone through, God's big enough. You're not going to hurt his feelings. You're not going to stump him. God's big enough to handle it all. So prayer is um, where the first thing where we start to cultivate life-changing knowledge. And the second one's going to be a shocker, I know. But the second way we grow in our knowledge of God is through being in God's Word. But challenging ourselves to think deeply about Scripture. Um, I know, this is like the most unshocking statement. A pastor saying, pray and read your Bible, right? But it's true. And we've kind of sold ourselves as a church. Not the church here, but as Christians. We've sold ourselves short. It's almost like a running gag. Oh, yeah, I don't pray enough. I should pray more. And oh, I'm not in God's word. I should be. But then nothing changes. We've almost accepted less than what God wants from us. We've made it, we've, we've made it okay. And so I just want to encourage you, pray. And be in God's word because Jen Wilkin, who's an incredible Bible teacher, she says, if you want to feel deeply about God, you have to learn to think deeply about him. And that's true. We have an inexhaustible treasure trove of revelation from God of who he is and what his redemptive plan is here. Right, right at our fingertips. People died just for the dream that people would, other people get to read these. And we have it available to us. I have like five Bibles in my office. I mean, it's incredible. And this is something that you will never exhaust the riches of this. If you feel like, eh, I've heard that story. Or, eh, I've read through the Bible front, you know, from the front to the back, and I know it all. You don't. There is always something more for you. I would be bold, as bold to say that there is something more for you of God on every single page that you could gather over the rest of your life and you'll only be scratching the surface of what's in here. So as we prayerfully study God's word, our minds will be transformed by the spirit, which will grow your relationship with God. And that's going to affect every area of your life. We see that in Romans 12, 2, where it says, do not be, and I don't think we have the passage for this up there. So Romans 12, 2, if you're taking notes. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. God's word is vital component of the renewal of our mind. 
And the reality is, is that if our faith isn't grounded in the Bible, we probably don't have much of faith. So as you focus more and more on God through his word, you'll grow deeper in your knowledge of him, which will lead to a greater hope, a greater understanding of who you are to God, and a greater understanding of the power that is at work in you. One caveat to these things is they take time and they take effort. To grow in our relationship with God, it's part of our sanctification process. And I described that earlier, but simply stated, our sanctification is God's transforming work in our lives to conform us to the image of Jesus. Eric Mason, who's a pastor in Philadelphia, wrote, Sanctification is a victorious struggle. Victorious in that Jesus has secured our sanctification. But it's a struggle in that we are called to be active pursuers of this holiness. So there is no way around it to prayer and to be in God's word. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes discipline. But it's worth it. Prayer and Bible study is like food and water for the soul. So we can't be surprised that if we neglect these things, that our faith is feeble, that it grows cold, that it may be malnourished or an impotent faith. If we want to grow in our knowledge of God, we have to make it a priority. And I promise you, I mean, I keep praying that as I get older, like this will change. Life is not going to cooperate. It's just not. There is always a million and one things that I need to do as opposed to pray and read the Bible. And I'm a pastor. I get paid to do those things. But I worked, I worked for the state for many years, so I know how it is when your job isn't centered around these things as well. So if it's hard for me, imagine how it is for everyone else. But I want to challenge you And I want to challenge us, I mean, I'm included in this, to make time every day, every day, to spend time in God, in prayer, in God's word. And if you're so busy that you can't do that, I gently exhort you. You need to change your life. You need to change your schedule so that you're less busy. Um, And I say that with, the utmost sensitivity and understanding and love. Please don't mishear me. And I could hear people say, like, you don't know my schedule. You don't know what's going on in my life. There is no way I could do that. And you're right. Like, I don't know you. I don't know what's going on in your life. But I do know that anything, and I promise you, anything pursued at the expense of your faith and your relationship with God is just not worth it. I'm sure we could bring testimony after testimony of people who will share that same sentiment and share that it's not worth the sacrifice. But I do know that when we trust God, when we trust God to lead us, and we make him a priority over everything else, that we're setting ourselves up to flourish, and that we won't regret it. I don't know a single person who has said, I wish I knew God less. I wish I didn't cultivate that relationship. I should have watched more TV. I should have worked more hours. I should have been lazier. Like, no, I just don't know anyone who's going to say that. But I know tons of people who wish they would have cultivated that relationship with God more, who are reaping the benefits down the road of what happens when that doesn't happen. And they would, they would say, I wish I worked less hours. I wish I disciplined myself more. So I promise you, you will flourish in God's terms, not the world's sense, and you will not regret it if you do. Um, what we see here in Ephesians 1, 15 through 23 It's not promised experience. It's not prosperity that leads to accomplishment of all your dreams so that you could just be you and fully realized. 
What we see here in Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, is that as you grow in your knowledge of God, which is applied to you by the Holy Spirit, yes, you're not guaranteed wealth, success, or a struggle-free life, but you receive something far greater. You receive more of God himself. And I promise you, it's worth it. Let's pray. Father, we're amazed at who you are. Um, I mean, words can express the awe and wonder of your grace and your love and your mercy, of your justice, of your majesty and glory. Um, But what we ask is that we can just grow in our knowledge of you and have it cultivate a deep personal relationship, Lord. Meet us this morning, no matter where we're at, and just show us just a little bit more of who you are and grow our faith just a little bit more that we can take those next steps in our lives so we may continue to cultivate the incredible faith that comes with knowing you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.